Hello. In this week's Torah portion, Yito, God gives the Torah to the Jews, to all the Jews gathered together at the foot of Mount Sinai. Quote, and all the people saw the voices and the torches, the sound of the shofar and the smoking mountain. The Lord said to Moses, so shall you say to the children of Israel, you have seen that from the heavens I have spoken with you, Unquote. The Torah is the basic document of Judaism. It is supplemented by the oral law or Mishnah, which describes in detail how to fulfill the commandments. In time, it gave rise to the Talmuds, the basic source of Jewish law. The Talmud has guided Jewish life for 2,000 years. The Talmud has been a favorite target of anti-Semites for at least a millennium. They take quotes out of context, truncate them, even fabricate them. They never mention it may be just one rabbi's opinion, and never mention that Jewish law or Jewish practice may be quite different from the plain texts. They do this to make Jews look bad and stir up hatred against them. These lies have resulted in the Talmud being censored, banned, or burned. Let's take a look at some of these so-called charges and answer them properly, particularly in light of the fact that these lies, lies have been proliferating exponentially on the internet. First, let me mention some major detractors of the Talmud. The first is 6th century Roman Emperor Justinian. In his Justinian Code, he writes, quote, the Mishnah we prohibit entirely, for it is not part of the sacred books, nor is it handed down by divine inspiration to the prophets, but is the handiwork of man, speaking only of earthly things and having nothing of the divine in it. Unquote. Then there are the disputations, which forced rabbis to debate Christian clerics. Example, Nicholas Donin led the 1240 disputation of Paris before King Louis IX, with Rabbi Yehiel of Paris and Rabbi Moshe ben Yaakov of Kusi defending. As a result, 24 wagon loads of Talmud volumes were burned. Pablo Cristiani led the 1263 disputation of Barcelona, with Nachmanides defending. Geronimo de Santa Fe led the 1413 disputation of Tortosa, Catalonia. Others are Johannes Pfefferkorn from 16th century Germany, Johann Andreas Eisenberger of Germany, who wrote The Traditions of the Jews in 1700, the Frankists in 18th and 19th century Europe, August Rowling of Prussia, who wrote Der Talmud Jude in 1871, Justinus Panaitis of Lithuania, who wrote The Talmud Unmasked in 1892, and in our own times, Elizabeth Dilling of the USA, who wrote The Plot Against Christianity in 1964, David Duke, and many Muslims, atheists, skeptics, and sad to say, even some Jews. Let us examine, examine 10 examples of Talmud distortions. Claim number one, Jews don't care whether Gentiles live or die. The proof is, the Talmud says, quote, whoever destroys a Jewish life, scripture considers it as if he had destroyed an entire world. And whoever saves a Jewish life, Scripture considers it as if he saved an entire world. Unquote. The answer is, there are two Talmuds, the Babylonian Talmuds and the Jerusalem Talmuds. This quote is from the Babylonian Talmud. The Jerusalem Talmud does not add the word Jewish. Quote, whoever destroyed, destroys a life is considered as if he had destroyed an entire world, and whoever saves a life is considered as if he had saved an entire world. Unquote. This more general statement also appears in many other Jewish sources. And how can it possibly be otherwise? Adam alone began the worlds, the entire worlds, and he was not Jewish. One could object that when the two Talmuds disagree, it's the Babylonian Talmud that's the authority. That is correct, but here they do not disagree. One made a more general statement than the other, that's all. Claim number two, Jews may kill Gentiles at will. The proof is, the Talmud says, quote, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai taught, even the goods among the Gentiles must be killed. Tov shebegoyim harok, unquote. The answer is, he meant in time of war. Here's the context. The Torah says, quote, and Pharaoh took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them, unquote. 
The Mechilta asks, where did the animals that drove the chariots come from? If you say they were from Egypt, doesn't it say in Exodus, all the cattle of Egypt died in the fifth plague, but none of the cattle of the people of Israel? If you say they were from Pharaoh, doesn't it say in Exodus, quote, Moses said to Pharaoh, Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon your cattle? If you say they were from the Jews, doesn't it say in Exodus, quote, Our cattle also shall go with us, not a hoof shall be left behind, unquote? Rather, those animals came from the Egyptians who feared gods and were not affected by the plagues. These animals caused, caused great hardship for the Jews by being used for chariots to pursue them. From here, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai said, kill even the good among the Gentiles. Bar Yochai then was just saying that in war, one must kill enemy soldiers, even if they're righteous people. Besides, Jewish law makes it very clear you don't have to be Jewish to win God's favor. In the second century, Tosefta says, quote, the righteous of all nations have a share in the world to come, unquote. A midrash says, quote, I quote, he I, I call heaven and earth as witnesses. Any individual, whether Gentile or Jew, man or woman, servant or maid, can bring the divine presence upon himself in accordance with his needs. Unquote. Claim number three, Jews allow sex with toddlers. The proof is, the Talmud says, quote, Rava said, if an adult has sex with a girl under the age of three, the matter is ignored. Unquote. The answer is in the context. This quote is from a discussion of a ketubah, which specifies what a man must pay his wife if he divorces her. A virgin bride gets a higher ketubah. The ruling is just that if a girl is molested before age three, she is still considered a virgin and is entitled to the higher ketubah. The ruling was made to protect women. Claim number four, never trust Jews. They can break promises at will. The proof is, on Yom Kippur, Jews recite Kol Nidre, quote, All vows we are likely to make, all oaths and pledges we are likely to take between this Yom Kippur and the next, we publicly renounce. Let them all be relinquished and abandoned, null and void, neither firm nor established. Let our vows, pledges, and oath not be considered vows, pledges, and oaths, unquote. The answer is, Kol Nidre nullifies only voluntary religious obligations a Jew takes upon himself if he cannot fulfill them for any reason. The Code of Jewish Law says, quote, Kol Nidre refers to a vow or oath promised to oneself alone. If the oath involves somebody else, the nullification does not apply, unquote. So Kol Nidre does not cancel promises that involve others. Claim number five. Jews don't want you to know how evil Judaism is. The proof is, the Talmud says, Rabbi Yohanan said, any non-Jew who studies the Torah deserves death, unquote. The answer is, the full quote shows a wide range of opinions on this subject. Rabbi Yohanan said, a non-Jew who studies the Torah deserves death, for it is written, Torah tzivalanu Moshe, morasha kehilat Yaakov. Moses commanded us a law, the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. So it is our inheritance, not theirs. If you read the word as morasha, that is an inheritance, then he steals it by, by studying because an inheritance only goes to specific people, not to everybody. If you vocalize the word differently and read it as meorasa, that is betrothed, then he is guilty of violating a betrothed maiden and therefore deserves stoning for adultery. An objection is raised. Rabbi Meir used to say, from where do we know that even a non-Jew who studies the Torah is like a high priest? From the verse in the Torah, you shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, with which if man does, he shall live in them. Unquote. It does not mention priests, Levites, and Israelites, but men. Hence you may learn that even a non-Jew who studies the Torah is like a high priest. Another rabbi says, said, that permission refers only to their own seven laws, unquote. So, Rabbi Yohanan was afraid that if the Roman occupiers learned Judaism, they would use it against the Jews. Rabbi Meir was more open-minded. Also, deserves death is a common expression of disapproval, no more. It is not a call to action. 
rabbis may not impose a death penalty not mentioned in the Torah. Claim number six. The Talmud considers itself holier than the Bible. The proof is, the Talmud says, quote, My son, be more careful in observing the words of the sages than the words of the Torah, unquote. The answer is, written laws require interpretation by the courts. The 71 members and Hedrin used to decide on the interpretation of the Torah by democratic majority votes, and that became Jewish law. So the Talmud is simply saying, look at how our sages interpreted the Torah for guidance. They will tell you how to apply it in your lives. Today, students in school learn from modern textbooks to understand the original papers of great thinkers. They do not go back to the original papers themselves. However, the Talmud itself raises an objection, quote, if the words of the sages are of such substance, why are they not written in the Torah itself? And the answer, because the making of books has no limits, unquote. In other words, there's no limit to how much commentary you can write on a written text as times change and new challenges arise. Claim number seven. Jews kill Christian children to use their blood to bake matzah for Passover. The proof is, there is none. The answer is, the Torah says seven times that Jews must not eat blood. Here's a sample. Quote, it shall be an everlasting statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings that you not eat blood. Unquote. This blood libel gave rise to 150 recorded cases that resulted in the murder of Jews, with more being reported. Claim number eight. A Jew is allowed to break Shabbat to save the life of another Jew, but not to save the life of a non-Jew. The proof is, the Mishnah says, quote, every danger to human life suspends the laws of Shabbat. If a structure falls on someone, and you don't know whether or not someone is buried there, or whether he's alive or dead, or whether he's Jewish or not, Dig into the heap of debris for his sake, even on Shabbat. If you find him alive, remove the debris. And if dead, leave him there until Shabbat is over. Unquote. The answer is, it does not actually say that non-Jews are ignored, although some may say it implies that. At any rate, it is not followed today, and there is no evidence it was ever followed. It has been regularly watered down over the centuries. The basic logic here here is that one can violate Shabbat to save someone so that he may observe other Shabbatot and commandments in the future. The objective is to maximize the observance of commandments. The Talmud says, quote, Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel said, the Torah said, profane one Shabbat for a Jew in danger of dying so that he may live to observe many Shabbatot in the future, unquote. One may ask, what if he's not an observant Jew? Rabbi Meiri from 13th century Catalonia said, We violate Shabbat to save a Jewish sinner because he may repent and confess his sins to God. Now, what if he's not Jewish but observes the seven Noahide laws? That is, no idolatry, murder, blaspheming, adultery, stealing, eating limbs off live animals, and establish courts of justice. The Ramban, also from 13th century Catalonia, says, one may violate Shabbat to save a Gertoshav, a Gentile who has officially accepted on himself to live a righteous life. What if a Jewish person's life is not in danger, but he is in danger of following fewer mitzvot? The Shulchan Aruch, Code of Jewish Law, says, quote, If a young Jewish girl is kidnapped and raised as a non-Jew, may Shabbat be violated to rescue her, even though her life is not in danger? Yes so she can have the opportunity to follow Jewish commandments in the future." Unquote. What if not saving Gentiles on Shabbat results in ill will that may endanger an entire Jewish community? Then one must save Gentiles on Shabbat. The practice today is best described by Rabbi, by, by Rabbi Dov Karol of Yeshivat Haaretzion. Quote, Many authorities over the last few hundred years ruled that the understanding which the Gemara takes for granted cannot be assumed in modern society. Rather, they claim if Jews refuse to treat Gentiles on Shabbat, this refusal could have disastrous ramifications, either for the doctor himself or for the Jewish community as a whole. As such, they rule that one should take whatever actions are necessary to save the life of a Gentile, even if it requires violating Shabbat laws. So, 
Whether or not one views the reason as self-serving, Gentiles must definitely be saved on Shabbat. Claim number nine. The Talmud approves of bestiality. The proof is, the Talmud says, quote, Adam had intercourse with every beast and animal, but found no satisfaction until he had intercourse with Eve, unquote. The answer is, the Talmud indeed says, quote, Rabbi Lazar further stated, what is meant by the text in the Torah? And Adam said, this time, this woman, Eve, is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Why did Adam say this time? This teaches that Adam had intercourse with every beast and animal, but found no satisfaction until he had intercourse with Eve. Unquote. Okay, but so what? The Torah had not yet been given, so Adam was not told bestiality was forbidden. He was alone in the world and was experimenting with his sexuality. Everything was new to him. Besides, the Talmud also says, quote, Yalta once says to Rav Nachman, Observe that for everything that the divine law has forbidden us, it has permitted us an equivalent. Unquote. The creation of Eve is a case in point. Finally, the Maharal and Radak both teach that the text must not be taken literally. Earlier, the Torah says, quote, And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every beast of the fields. But for Adam, there was not found a help to match him. Unquote. So they conclude, Adam merely named the animals to understand their essence, their strengths and weaknesses, and did not have intercourse with them. Claim number 10. Jews are cruel, lack compassion, and always lust for revenge. They practice retaliation in kind, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If someone puts out your eye, go ahead and put out his eye. Give him a dose of his own medicine. Even the Pope accused Jews of applying this injunction literally in a 1980 encyclical. The proof is, the Torah says three times, in Exodus, you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. In Leviticus, a fracture for a fracture, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Just as he inflicted an injury upon a person, so shall it be given to him. In Deuteronomy, and you shall have no pity, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. The answer is, there is no records of Jews ever doing this. The Talmud specifically said that the injunction refers only to financial compensation. Its purpose is to set a limit to it. Do not, do not ask for more than the value of an eye for the loss of an eye. The penalty must be proportional to the offense, not higher than the offense. The arguments are quite clever, and I presented them in another Devar Torah. Note that just about everyone in the world retaliates in kind, except the Jews. And yet, they are the ones blamed for introducing that principle and applying it right and left. So what else is new? Shabbat Shalom.